In the gospel for today's feast, the feast of Christ the King, our Lord delivers a very simple but profound teaching on how we will be judged by God at the end of our earthly lives. In the final chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, our Lord says that on that day, the day of final judgment, all of humanity, every human person who has ever lived, will stand before Christ, our King, and be divided into one of two groups, either the sheep or the goats. Now, sheep and goats may look alike, but they're very different kinds of animals. By nature, sheep are docile and gentle animals. They flock together easily, and they readily follow the lead of the shepherd. Goats, on the other hand, are stubborn animals. They stray away on their own and are more aggressive and combative, more likely to go their own way. Our Lord uses this image to teach us the necessity of following His way, that is, loving God and exercising charity for our neighbor. After all, this is what Jesus did. He showed his love for God the Father by giving himself for us. This teaching of Jesus has traditionally been called the corporal works of mercy, namely feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, sheltering the stranger, and providing care and comfort for the sick, and visiting those who are in prison. To these separate corporal works of mercy, we must also add the spiritual works of mercy, counseling the doubtful, instructing the ignorant, admonishing the sinner, comforting the sorrowful, forgiving injuries, bearing wrongs patiently, and praying for the living and the dead. And so far as we do these things out of love for God and neighbor, we do them for our Lord Jesus himself. And yet, insofar as we neglect to do them for our brothers and sisters, we neglect to acknowledge the presence of Jesus among us. Today, I want to illustrate the corporal and spiritual works of mercy by reflecting with you on the life of a very humble priest, a Capuchin friar, who was beatified just six years ago. His name is Blessed Solanus Casey, and he was born on November 25th, 1870, on a farm in Oak Grove, Wisconsin. He was one of 16 children born to Irish immigrant parents who came to America during the potato famine in Ireland and who settled on 80 acres of land in rural Wisconsin. His parents raised their large family there, 10 boys and 6 girls, including two sons who would one day become priests. Bernard Francis Casey, and another son named Edward. As a boy, everyone called young Bernard Barney. When Barney was seven years old, there was an outbreak of diphtheria in the area. And while two of Barney's siblings died during the outbreak, little Barney survived. However, the disease left his voice hoarse and wispy for the rest of his life. And that was a real hardship because... While Barney was musically inclined and played the violin, because of his damaged vocal cords, he could not sing. As a young man, Barney was just an average student. And beginning as a teenager, he went to work at a number of jobs, including working as a lumberjack, a hospital orderly, and a prison guard. He met a young woman and fell in love and even proposed marriage to her. But when her mother found out that she wanted to marry Barney Casey, a young man whom she felt had no real prospects, she promptly sent her daughter off to a boarding school, and that was the end of that. Barney then got a job as a streetcar conductor in Superior, Wisconsin. And it was while he was working at that job that he witnessed something that changed his life. One day, Barney was driving his streetcar through a rough part of town when he witnessed a drunken sailor stab a young woman to death. That act of violence affected him so deeply that Barney asked the Lord to show him what he wanted him to do with the rest of his life. And he began at that point to feel a call to priesthood. He applied to enter the diocesan seminary, but he wasn't accepted. 
not smart enough to be a parish priest, he was told. But his superior suggested that he try to enter a religious community and serve as a brother. Barney didn't know what community to petition to join, and so he and his mother and sister made a nine-day novena to the Blessed Mother in the days leading up to the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And on the ninth day of the novena, immediately after he received communion at Mass, Barney heard the Blessed Mother speaking very clearly to him, and she said, Barney, go to Detroit. The year was 1896, and Barney was then 26 years old. In Detroit, Barney found a Franciscan monastery, the Capuchin Friary of St. Bonaventure. And on Christmas Eve in the year 1896, he arrived at the front door of the friary. Barney was so exhausted from traveling three days in a snowstorm that he literally fell asleep on the front steps of the friary. The bells for midnight mass awakened him, though, and he immediately went into the monastic church and joined the Capuchin friars at Christmas midnight mass. From then on, Barney had found his spiritual home. The Capuchin friars accepted him as a candidate for their community, and he put on the brown robes of a friar and was given the religious name Solanus. S-O-L-A-N-U-S. Eight years later, when he was 34, Barney Casey was ordained a priest, but because he hadn't done well in his seminary classes during his years of formation, he was designated a priest simplex, a simple priest, which meant that while he could say mass, he wasn't permitted to preach in public or hear confessions. It was a humiliating Disappointment, to be sure. But young Father Solanus accepted the decision of his superiors with obedience and humility. At the friary, Father Solanus was assigned to be the church sacristan and to be the porter or the doorkeeper for the monastery. And yet, if Solanus hadn't done well in his seminary studies, he excelled in prayer and good works. He was known as a very humble, gentle, and joyful soul. And the other friars became aware that at night he would spend long hours before our Lord in the tabernacle, all alone in the chapel, sometimes playing the violin for Jesus. As doorkeeper of his religious community, people soon began to come to the friary just to see him. In fact, they came first one by one, then by the dozens, and finally by the hundreds to seek his counsel and to be prayed over by him. Many people experienced miraculous healings after Father Solanus prayed over them, and many conversions took place. By his own admission, Father Solanus had two special loves. He loved the sick and he loved the poor. And he ministered tirelessly to both groups, practicing both the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. During the Depression, he opened a large soup kitchen for the hungry. And that soup kitchen is still in existence today. The hallmark of his faith was the spirit of thanksgiving, of gratitude to God. Father Solanus often said, give thanks to God in advance when you ask a favor of him and then expect him to act. He also said, God humbles himself to use our powers if we don't spoil his plans with our own. If we serve God in this way, Father Solanus said, then at the end of our lives we will tumble into our graves with the confidence of tired children who fall into bed at their father's command at the end of the day. What a beautiful image of a holy and happy death. One interesting thing about Father Solanus is that he bore a very strong spiritual resemblance to the doorkeeper of another religious community at that time. And I'm speaking about St. Andre Bessette, who was 24, 25 years older than Father Solanus. 
Brother Andre was a Holy Cross brother who spent his life as the doorkeeper of a Holy Cross monastery in Montreal. And he ended up founding St. Joseph's Oratory, a place of pilgrimage in North America. Their lives and their ministries were strikingly similar. And when Brother Andre was 90 and Father Solanus was 65, the two men met for the first and only time. Father Solanus only spoke English and Brother Andre spoke only French, but these two kindred souls communicated very well. One last thing. Throughout his life, Father Solanus suffered from a a very painful skin disease that only grew worse as he aged. The miracle which led to his beatification occurred in 2012 when a woman from Panama, who had never heard of Father Solanus, visited Detroit and was taken by friends to his tomb at St. Bonaventure's. For years, she also had suffered from an incurable skin disease, and when she approached the tomb of Father Solanus, she was instantly healed. Today we pray for the grace of a holy advent that begins next Sunday, and we also pray for the grace of a holy life and a holy death so that we will be counted among the sheep and not the goats on the day that Christ our King returns to judge the living and the dead. Blessed Solanus Casey, pray for us.